We're going to be talking about impulse, which we have to introduce, but also momentum, which we have to introduce. You may have seen that before. But we have to basically introduce these two new topics. So our goal is to basically explore what happens to an object subjected to a strong but short force. Can you imagine that soccer ball basically subjecting that poor man's face to a strong but short duration impulsive force, right? Uh, and then we're going to define and study this product called momentum, which is the mass times the velocity. And some of you may have seen this before. It's a relatively straightforward concept, but you'll see that there are lots of places to get tripped up. So let's think about collisions. This is going to be the rest of the, the, the course, talking about energy of collisions, the momentum of collisions, really understanding energy and momentum conservation. So a collision is a short duration interaction between two objects. Again, think soccer ball and face, or cannonball and stomach, or someone's fist and the stomach. These are collisions. It's a short duration, very high force, typically. So the collision between a tennis ball and a racket is very quick, right? This happens so fast that you often can never even see what happens here, which is that the ball gets compressed, right? This, this tennis ball is getting squeezed. And I'll show you a movie in a second where it gets squeezed basically to about a centimeter thin pancake. So it happens in a very quick amount of time, but it's not instantaneous. We won't consider this as instantaneous. We'll actually try to understand what are the forces acting when this thing happens. Notice that the right side of the ball in this picture is basically flat. What would happen if I squeeze a ball, like a tennis ball, and I squeeze it just like I squeeze in that picture, so I flatten one side? What would happen to the ball? It wants to pop back the other way, right? This is just like we talked about last week. It's a spring. When I change some displacement, I put energy into the system, which we'll talk about. It has a, a spring, a Hooke's law that says, when I compress it, it wants to go back to equilibrium. And so as that ball goes back into equilibrium, it's basically bouncing back away from the tennis racket. Now, the other part of this problem that's very much like a spring is the racket head itself. This whole mesh serves as a spring. When it gets extended, it wants to return back to equilibrium. So you have these two springs basically bouncing into one another, and that's what's propelling these tennis balls at very high speed. What's a typical serve speed in a, in a professional tennis match? Any guess? It's basically 120. The, the, the records are something like 140. Okay? Typical is between 120, 125, something like this. That's extremely fast. And it's happening because these two springs are basically working together. So it takes time to compress the ball, right? This happens over a few milliseconds, and time for the ball to re-expand as it leaves the racket. So there's a very large force acting over a very <laughs> short period of time. And if here's a question that I can ask you. If this ball flies in from the left, heading towards the racket, and then it interacts, which way is it going to bounce back? Back to the left, okay? So this is what we're going to see is related to this thing called momentum. When I have a, a strong force pushing this object away, it's going to change its velocity into the other direction. So here's the question we'll ask at the very end, which is a tennis serve in slow motion. So when a racket collides with a tennis ball traveling at a typical volley speed, how many Gs, you remember when we talked about pulling Gs, how many Gs does this tennis ball experience? <coughs> Let me show you before we... This isn't trivial, so we have to work through it. But we're going to get back to this problem in a bit. When we think about collisions, you can kind of imagine this now. We have, even at the atomic level, right? you can think of these as little atoms connected by strings. You have object A, let's say the tennis ball, coming into contact with object B. And look at this diagram really carefully. There's an initial velocity of A moving towards B. B is, in this example, sitting still. There's a point where they both get compressed. But if I pause right at that instant when they're in contact, I could draw forces and apply Newton's third law. You see that what I've done here is I've said, oh, there's a third law pair. There's the force of A acting on B and the equal and opposite force of B acting on A. Were those forces there before they came into contact? No. So there's this short instant where there's this really big third law pair where they're pushing against each other, and those forces then basically go away after they rebound and change speeds in the other direction. So in this example, again, think tennis racket and ball. The tennis ball gets pushed back the other way. As soon as they lose contact, those forces go away. 
So what does this vector do? As a function of time, it starts at zero. It, it slowly gets bigger, right? That contact force gets really, really, really big, and then it shrinks again, and then becomes zero as they lose contact. Does that make sense? So over this short period of time, the force is really, really large, but then it has to go away when they lose contact. So we can actually plot this in some kind of fast time scale. Imagine you had this slow motion camera, and what you were plotting was, for instance, that soccer ball hitting his face. That soccer ball is applying a force on his face, but in that instant, there's an equal and opposite force of his face on the soccer ball. So if you measure the force of the soccer ball on face, or the force of A on B, as soon as the contact begins, as soon as that soccer ball hits him in the face, there's a force that goes up, it reaches a point of maximum compression, and then it rebounds, right? So again, think either the tennis ball or his face, it's like a spring, it gets compressed, and then it starts to expand, and then they lose contact, right? So that ball hits him in the face, and then stops, or runs, bounces the other way. So in that short period of time, there's a pretty complicated series of events where the force of A on B increases and then decreases. And we'll come to call this basically the force that leads to something called impulse. And you'll see that in a second. So now we'll just apply Newton's law. So we're going to go step by step. Remember, Newton's law is the mass times the acceleration. This is the second law. And that's equal to the force as a function of time. So you can ask, if a tennis ball hit me in the face, and this was the force of that tennis ball pummeling me in the head, how would I accelerate? Right? This is a legitimate question. It's a very simple one. We've done things like this before. Here's where we're going to start to work into integration. You're going to see more of this in physics 2b and 2c, so we're going to work harder here to see it. I'm going to do some rearranging here. If I take this term, mass times dvx, and I just multiply this term to the other side, or into the other side of this one, I get this expression, mass times the differential velocity is equal to force times the differential in time. Okay? How do you then solve a differential equation like this, you integrate both sides. This is something you've seen already before in this class, you'll see it again, is that to solve a differential form of equation, I then have to integrate the left side and the right side. Okay? So I've just done some algebra. Now to solve this, these are pretty easy integrals. Right? If I just take mass, it comes out of the integral, and I have the Integration over some velocity, a differential velocity from initial to final is just the final velocity minus the initial velocity. Okay? The other integral, force times dt, we're going to give it a name. Now wait, forget about calculus for a second. How would I find, what did we say about integrals? When you have a, a picture like this, how do we find the integral of that graph? I hear it. It's the area under the curve. So although I may not have a complicated problem where you have to solve something like this, this quantity, this integral of force in time, is the area under this curve. Okay? So this is just some math that we're going to need. And here's where we're going to define something called momentum. So you saw on the left side of that equation, there was a term that looked like mass times the final velocity and mass times the initial velocity. And then you saw this term that was force times time. We integrate the area under that funny curve. Right? So we're going to define, at this point, something called momentum. Momentum is pretty simple, because usually it's just mass times velocity, where the mass is constant. In this class and anything you'll do, the mass remains constant. Okay? So it's basically a vector quantity just like velocity but then read scale by the mass. This is going to be called momentum. Now, think about it for a second. If I'm a massive object, like a tractor-trailer truck, moving down the highway at 80 miles per hour, we would say that has a much higher momentum than, say, me on my bicycle, moving at the same speed. That's because the truck's mass is much larger. So there's a much larger momentum when you have a much larger mass for a fixed velocity. Equally, I could be very light. I could be me running down the highway at 1,000 miles per hour, and that would give me a very large momentum compared to a truck. Even though it's massive, if it's moving a few miles per hour, I could have very high momentum. So the momentum is defined as mass times velocity. And I can then change this equation just to write down 
this area under the force time curve is just a difference in momentum. Okay? I have a quick question just to test our understanding for a second. If I have a ball coming into, let's say this top of this stool is the racket. If I have a ball coming into the racket, which direction is the velocity, positive or negative? Positive. positive right? That's our convention, right? Positive x-axis. It comes into this racket and then it bounces the other way. Okay? Which way is its velocity after it bounces? Negative. Negative. So something happened to its momentum. It had a positive momentum coming in because it had a positive velocity. It had a negative momentum coming out. Does that make sense? Right? What caused it to change its momentum? What caused it to do that? The force of this racket on the ball. Do you see that to change momentum, I have to have a force over some period of time. I had a positive momentum, there was a force of the racket on the ball, that force pushed it back, I then had a negative momentum. That's what this equation is saying. That if I have a force acting over some short period of time, I am able to change an object's velocity. Right? I can change its momentum. This, in fact, is how Newton explained physics. Right? He understood that objects that were more massive and had higher velocities had this thing that seemed to only change when the force was applied. So when we take Newton's law, we said that it was mass times acceleration, but in fact, the way Newton understood it was mass times the change in velocity, but we could write that as just a change in momentum. So again, if I have this ball, it hits a racket, and I know that its momentum changed, that means there had to be a force acting on the object. Is that intuitive to you? Right? If I have something that's moving this way and then suddenly it's going that way, there had to be something to change its velocity. Okay? That was what Newton told us, and we've worked with a lot of this, but now we have kind of a new form. Now one other thing, this is really important. Do you remember we had to add vectors? Right? You probably all threw that away after exam one and said, ah, I'll never need that again. It turns out you absolutely need it, because when you think about momentum, it's a vector that has x components, y components, and z components. It's a three-dimensional vector quantity, just like velocity, and in the same direction as velocity. If I know the direction of my velocity, I know the direction of my momentum vector. Okay? And this thing implicitly assumes, and we'll not break this assumption in this class, is that the mass is basically conserved. There's one place where we can break this assumption, and we won't talk about it here, but when you do rockets, when you solve the rocket equation, mass is changing. Okay? We're not going to do that in here. So let's see if we understand it. I've given you enough to try this problem. Take a minute or two. This is basically the problem. And you can imagine it very easily, right? A ball moving with speed v at some angle theta from the horizontal bounces obliquely back up and it returns at the same speed and at the same angle above the horizon. Right? So I can do this in slow motion, or I can do it fast, but let me just pretend what it means. It's basically that I come in with a velocity, I have an impact, a collision, and then I bounce out with a different velocity going this way. Which direction is my incoming velocity vector? Now, which is the x direction of that velocity vector? To the right. What's the y direction of this velocity vector? Down. Okay. Now when it comes up, which direction is the velocity vector? Following the ball. Which direction is the x direction? To the right. Did the x direction change? No. What about the y direction? Yeah. It changed. Okay. So look at this problem, and we know now this thing is called momentum. We know the way to find it is to take the final kind of momentum minus the initial momentum. And it's a vector quantity. So what is the magnitude of the change in this ball, as it, its momentum as it bounces through this thing. So draw a picture, solve this. You know that the change in velocity doesn't happen in x, it only happens in y. Take another 30 seconds. Draw, draw a picture. You have to basically decompose these vector quantities. <laughs> 
right, take about 20 more seconds. the change in angular coordinate, you write it this way. What is the final momentum? Let's break this down. In the x direction, how does the momentum change? It doesn't, right? It was the same momentum both ways. Now, figure out what the y component and how it changes. Take another minute and tell me how the y component changes. I had one answer and it got it right. 100% were right for like a microsecond. Okay, so let's stop this in 10 seconds. Get something down. This looks much more promising. Yay. So see if the last 15% of you can change your minds. <laughs> okay, I'm going to stop in about two seconds. I think I have everybody but one. Okay, there it was. Okay, so 80% of you said E that it was 2mv sine theta. So how did we get that? We just subtracted the final mv sine theta minus a negative mv sine theta. And that gives you 2 mv sine theta. So the answer is, in fact, e. What happened here? So it's a really common thing that happened. When I changed momentum, I saw that the x momentum did not change. The y momentum changed. And it changed by a factor of twice the incoming momentum. 
So when I have an object that undergoes an elastic collision, when there's no energy loss in the collision, I have a momentum coming in, let's say 1 mv, and I have a momentum going out that's also mv in the other direction, but the total change was twice that value mv. Do you see that here? That the answer came out with a factor of 2 because I went from forward to positive, to, to reverse. Okay? That means I had to change twice my momentum. I had to go from finite momentum to zero, and then zero to finite momentum in the reverse direction. So this is a very common piece of physics that we'll see. Let's move on and we'll see it again in a bit. So we now define, this is something you'll work out in the homework quite a bit, this impulse momentum theory, that the change in momentum is just equal to the integrated force. So if I give you a force time diagram, you take the area under the curve, and you know how the velocity is going to change. This thing J, J is called the impulse. So if I ask you about impulse, it's basically force integrated in time. And we can compact this all into a very simple expression which says that the change in momentum is equal to the impulse. If I have a force acting over a short period of time, that's an impulse, and it changes my momentum directly dependent on the direction and magnitude of that impulse. The other way you can see is that this breaks down into vector components. I can have this in the x and the y and the z. When you think about that soccer ball hitting that guy's face, there were changes in momentum in all different directions because there were forces acting in all different directions that were distorting his face. So if you wanted to solve that equation and you had a graphics engine like the real engine, you would basically be able to do that. Now, the other thing that you'll see is that this is written a little bit more succinctly, that instead of taking the integral of that area, we can just take the average value times delta t. So this is a much simpler way to do it. If you know the average value of the force over that time, you just find the area of a rectangle that is at the average value. Okay, so when you're solving problems, you'll see this. So coming back to what we just said, here is this wall applies an impulse to the ball. The ball moves in to the right, it then bounces back to the left because there was a force acting on it. And you have to notice that the signs of the velocity and the momentum are the same as J. So if I have a force pushing it back that way, that means my change in momentum had to be that way. Here's what you'll see in the textbook. This is basically the same thing. For a short amount of time, there's a negative force applied. I take the area under this curve, and that's my impulse. And if I have a negative force, that means that my momentum change had to be negative. Right? Delta P is equal to J. And then I can plot this as just taking the momentum. You can imagine this ball comes in with a positive momentum. It slows to a stop. It then reverses direction and goes backwards. Okay? Here's another thing. This is, again, I'm going to show this. I don't really use this often in here, but the textbook will talk a lot about this. You can do this all using bar charts. I'll let you read it. You'll never need this. It actually is a reasonable thing to do, but it's just not so useful that we won't use it too much. Okay? Let's see if we understand this now. Now we, we saw an example how to solve this. This one's just the same type. There's a cart that rolls into a wall, collides with the wall, and then it's leaving with a less speed, right? It has the same mass, its mass doesn't change, but it's now leaving with a slower speed. Find the change in momentum, right? The same thing we did in the last one. This one's even easier because you only have an x direction. So take about a minute, see if you can calculate what is the change in the x momentum. There's an initial momentum and a final momentum. Take about a minute. I will be right back and see if I can get a number. No, Okay, take about 10 more seconds. 
get an answer in. Two or three more seconds. Oh, I've got a tie. Okay, last few. Okay, stop. So I got the majority. The majority got the right answer, but the majority was only 38%. Okay. Look at how we did it before. I take the final momentum minus the initial momentum. That's my change in momentum. What's the final momentum here? It's just this mass, 10 kilograms times 1 meters per second, right? Which direction is the final momentum? Positive. What's the initial momentum? Mass times 2 meters per second. Which direction is it? Negative. If I write this down, I'm going to take... What did we say it was? The final was? So it's 1 times 10, so it's 10 kilograms meters per second. And what was the other one? Negative 20. Again, we see the same trick. You see the same trick. If I calculate carefully the change in momentum, I get 10 kilograms per meter per second minus a negative 20 kilogram meters per second. That gives me a plus sign, which adds these two together to give me 30 kilogram meters per second. Okay? So if you just, rather than think so hard about it, if you just carefully write down P final minus P initial, you'll get the magnitude every single time, as long as you keep track of those changes in direction. Okay? So, you can see that the solution, again, is very simple. It comes out to exactly what I drew. There's a negative initial momentum, and so that takes a subtraction of a minus quantity. It gives it a plus. And it gives exactly what we said before, that the change in momentum is in which direction? Which direction was the change in momentum in this problem? Positive. Which direction was the force acting on the cart? What, which direction does the wall push on the cart? Positive, right? In that impact, there's a force of cart on wall and a force of wall on cart. That pushes it in that direction. The force of the wall is causing an impulse which changes its momentum to be positive. Okay? So it all seems to make physical sense. Again, you can write this down with these little bar graphs, but it's, to, it's the same information, just written a slightly different. So let's get to this. Well, let's get to this thing first because I found one I think that works. Maybe not. Let's see if it works. I don't know. It worked a minute ago. It might not work now. It works. Now let's see if we can get through. Okay. Let me try. I don't know if it'll work. Let's give it a shot. <laughs> Shoot my eyes. Let me do it one way, just like this. Ooh. Not quite. I can't get it to go straight. But how is it working? Why is it doing this? Right? I have this object, a little ball. I have three larger ones. This one sits on top. Its initial momentum is which direction? Down. What is the force acting on this ball? Up. It's the force of the floor on this ball, the force of that ball on the second ball, the force of that ball on the third, the force of all of those translated upward to the smallest mass. So if I have a change in momentum of these large objects that I'm transferring to something with a small mass, what does that happen to its velocity? its velocity is big, okay? This object is basically just doing exactly what we said. There's an impulse, and it shoots off into the air, okay? So let's solve this last problem. We saw the video. Now we're going to work through it. I'm actually not going to do this one as a quiz. 
Let's just work through it really carefully. So here's the tennis racket problem we asked at the very beginning. A tennis ball of some mass strikes a tennis racket with a velocity of 30 meters per second, and it rebounds with a velocity of 40 meters per second in the opposite direction. Does that part look familiar? Right? This is now the third time we've seen the same exact problem. So what are the magnitude and direction of the ball's change in momentum? So rather than quiz again, let's just go through it. I'm going to leave this up. I guess I will do the dot cam in the middle. So here's the general strategy in these problems. When I'm talking about momentum, the first thing I want to do is draw the motion. I want to imagine the motion. And in momentum problems, I take the before case and the after case. I think of that instant after the force was applied. So there's an initial velocity to the right of 30 meters per second. There's another velocity to the left of 40 meters per second. And just like the previous problems, We start by writing the change in momentum, mass times the final velocity minus the mass times the initial velocity. And we can get this, again, this should look familiar, right? Here's the final momentum, it's negative. Here's the initial momentum, which is positive. Take their difference, and you get a negative momentum where we can calculate that number. So there's a negative momentum of 4.3 kilogram meters per second. This is exactly the same problem we've now solved three times. Okay? So if you look at these answers, it's basically answer D. Okay? Now we can ask another question. This is getting to how many G's this ball holds. The next question is, if the ball is in contact with the racket for 6 milliseconds, so a very short amount of time, what is the average impact force on the ball due to the racket? How do we find an impact force over this short period of time? What do we use? This impulse momentum theory. If we know the change in momentum, which we just calculated, it's this, then we know the impulse force. So to solve that, we just start with this definition of the impulse momentum. If I have a change in momentum, it's basically the average force times the time interval. They, were, they gave us the time interval. And so we see that over that little short period of time, on average, there's a 700 newton force acting on the ball. So the fact that it changed from 30 meters per second in one direction to 40 in the other required that there was a 700 newton average force acting over that short period of time. Okay. The last piece is how many Gs is that? So here's the weight of that ball. They gave us. Again, the weight is 0 0.06 kilograms. When we plug that in with 9.8 meters per second, we get something like a little more than half a newton, right? So this is the weight, the gravitational force on that object. To find how much, how many g's that ball holds, you take the ratio of that average force. Take the ratio of the average force, which is 700 newtons, divided by the ball's weight, which was a little more than half a newton, and you get something that's almost 1,200. So the tennis ball pulls nearly 1,200 Gs in the six milliseconds that it's in contact with the racket. Can you imagine if your body pulled 1,200 Gs? What would you turn 